namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry for the little mix up that happened last Tuesday. <laughs> but I'm glad that you were able to come back on Thursday. Okay, this time we'll, we'll be taking. Sutta number 12. This is called the Mahasihanada Sutta, which means the greater discourse or the longer discourse on the lion's roar. And this is contrasted with the Sutta that precedes it, which is the Chula Sihanada Sutta the shorter discourse on the lion's roar. And maybe there's a difference between the two in that the shorter discourse on the lion's roar is a lion's roar that a disciple of the Buddha can utter, whereas this this sutta on the lion's roar is a lion's roar that the Buddha himself utters. And this lion's roar is concerned principally with the Buddha's declaration or exposition of his special powers of knowledge and his, what's called the grounds of self-confidence. So here it's called the four kinds of intrepidity. And in the sequence of our program of studies, In the earlier classes, we were explaining the different stages of realization of disciples, up the different types of stream entry, once returning, non-returning, get arhatship. And so now we come to the special qualities of the founder of the Buddha's dispensation, the Buddha's teaching, that is the special qualities of the Buddha himself. And this sutta, arises in response to a particular incident, something that took place during the Buddha's ministry. And this was the disrobing of a monk by the name of Sunakata. Sunakata was originally from the city of Vesali. He was a member of the Lichafi clan. The Lichafis was a kind of a kind of aristocratic clan which originated from the city of Vesali. And Sunakata had become a monk because he was very impressed with the idea that ascetics, renunciants, are able to acquire, to perform supernormal feats miraculous feats and he thought that if he becomes a monk under the Buddha he would be able to see the Buddha performing miraculous feats and he would learn how to perform miraculous feats himself. And when he came to the Buddha to get instructions and guidance the Buddha was teaching him the Dhamma for the purpose of gaining liberation from suffering. (laughs) And time and time again, he was just getting instructions how to get liberation from suffering. (laughs) And he was always examining the Buddha, looking at the Buddha, trying to see, is the Buddha going to perform a miracle? Is the Buddha going to perform any wondrous feats? And also he wanted to get some explanation from the Buddha about how 
everything originated, some explanation about how the world started, how the universe started, how human beings first came into existence, how plants and animals first started. And he wasn't getting from the Buddha the kind of explanation that satisfied him. And there's a sutta that comes in the Diga Nikaya, which gives a somewhat more detailed account of Sunakita's career under the Buddha and about the events that led to his disrobing. This is called the Patika Sutta. It's sutta number 24 in the Diga Nikaya. It's the first sutta in part three of the Diga Nikaya. And if you ever think that the suttas are very dry and don't have any humor, then you should read that sutta, the Patika Sutta. Because the Patika Sutta, I think, is almost like almost like slapstick comedy parts of it, if you can imagine <laughs> a Buddhist version of slapstick comedy. I say the early paragraphs in the sutta seem to be quite straightforward histor historical fact, but what follows, I suspect to have been the work of the compilers of the canon in order to give a touch of humor to the sutta. Like um, there's an incident where Sunakata and the Buddha are walking together on arms round and Sunakata sees an ascetic who's observing the dog practice. That is, he's walking around on all fours, eating his food with his mouth, completely naked, trying to behave just like a dog. Then Sunakata says, that ascetic over there must be in our hunt, a liberated one. Then the Buddha says to him, Sunakata, you wouldn't know an our hunt if you saw one. <laughs> and Sunakata says, What's the matter with you, sir? Are you envious of somebody else being an our hunt? You think you're the only our hunt? Then the Buddha says, In a in a week from now, this ascetic is going to die. You can go to him when he's put on his funeral pyre. You touch his body and ask him where he is. And he'll tell you that he's been reborn amongst the lowest realm of the pratas, the afflicted spirits. So then a week or maybe two weeks later, that ascetic dies. Sunakata goes to his the cremation ground, finds his body on the funeral pyre, touches the body and says to him, where are you now? <laughs> Even though he's dead, he, <laughs> he lifts up his head and says, I've been reborn in the lowest realm of the hungry, of the afflicted spirits. Then he goes back and lies down dead. <laughs> but Sunakata still thinks that the Buddha hasn't yet performed a miraculous feat. Then a couple of weeks later, Sunakata is going on alms round with the Buddha and they see another ascetic who's observing some very, very strict ascetic practices. And then Sunakata says to the Buddha, there's an arahant for you. Truly, that's an arahant. Then the Buddha says to him, Sunakata, you wouldn't know an arahant if you saw one. Then Sunakata gets angry and says, How can you deny that that's an arahant? See how strict he's practicing? Then the Buddha says to him, In a couple of weeks from now, that strict ascetic is going to be 
married, living in a luxurious mansion with people waiting on him, <laughs> enjoying three meals a day. You wait and see. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, the news comes spreading around <laughs> that that very strict ascetic has given up the ascetic life, he's gotten married, <laughs> and he's now living in his, maybe he's married a w rich woman, so he's now living in a very splendid mansion with servants attending upon him. <laughs> but Sunakata still doesn't believe that the Buddha can perform any kind of miraculous feat. Then there is some other ascetic that has made a claim that says, he, he says that let the Buddha come and engage in a contest with me of miraculous powers. If the Buddha performs any miracle, any wondrous feat, I will be able to outdo him to perform a feat twice as splendid, twice as wonderful as anything that the Buddha can perform. And when Sunakata hears that, he thinks, that's wonderful. I have complete faith in that ascetic. That's name, his name is Patikaputta. I'm going to challenge the Buddha. The Buddha should go and meet that ascetic and have the contest with him. And so Sunakata goes to the Buddha and reports this claim to the Buddha. And so the Buddha hears this challenge from Sunakata and says, okay, I'll accept the challenge. And he goes to the park of this other ascetic and he says that, let them call that ascetic, Patikaputta. Let him come and engage in a contest with me. So then the followers of Patikaputta, <laughs> they go to him in his residence and they say, the Buddha has gone to your park. He's ready to engage in the contest with you. Come along. You could make good on your claim and engage him in, a dis in that contest. And he's sitting in his seat and he says, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. But he can't get up from his seat. <laughs> then other people come, his devotees, they come and say, come, come, the Buddha has gone to your park. He's ready to engage you in the contest. Come along. And he says, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. But he's just sitting there trying to get up, but he can't get up from his seat. <laughs> and so about three or four of his followers, they all come to him and say, come along, come along. Everybody, the crowd is gathering in the park, waiting for the contest. They all are expecting you to arrive. And he keeps on saying, I'm coming, I'm coming. But he can't get up from his seat. But Despite all of this, Sunakata still loses his confidence in the Buddha. Then he gives up his robe. He becomes angry at the Buddha. And then he goes around in the city of Vaisali, which was a very prominent city in India at that period. And he starts making this claim which we meet in paragraph two of the sutta, debunking the Buddha. He now says that the ascetic, the recluse Gotama, does not have any superhuman states, that's any kind of attainments higher than mere human good qualities. He doesn't have any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. 
and he teaches a Dharma, a doctrine, which he has merely worked out by reasoning. So he thinks that the Buddha is, is a mere rationalist, one who has worked out a doctrine intellectually, not through direct insight or vision or higher realization. And then he wants to criticize the Buddha, and so he says, when he teaches his Dharma to anyone, it leads him, when he practices it, to the complete destruction of suffering. He thinks that this is a way of criticizing the Buddha, but it's actually a kind of praise for the Buddha. Okay, so now, one day, the Venerable Sariputta goes into Vaisali on alms round, and then he hears this former monk, Sunakita, making this claim in Vaisali. And so then he goes to the Buddha and reports to the Buddha what he's heard. And then the Buddha says that this Sunakita, he calls him a misguided man, has now become angry and he's speaking these words out of anger. And even though he's thinking to discredit the Tathagata, to debunk him, but he's actually praising him when he says that the Dhamma that the Buddha teaches leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Okay, now the Buddha is going to start to enumerate some of the qualities of himself that Sunakata will never be able to comprehend, will never be able to infer of him in accordance with the Dhamma. First, he says, Sunakata will never be able to infer that I myself, the Bhagavad, am accomplished, that I'm an Arahant, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, the incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, the enlightened one, the blessed or the exalted one. These are the famous nine qualities of the Buddha. I explain these in detail in the discourses on Majjhima Sutta number 27. So I won't go through these again. Then, he says, he will never infer of me according to Dhamma, now he's going to mention the real supernormal powers that the Buddha does actually possess. This is the ability, having one body, to transform it into many bodies. So that the Buddha, and not only the Buddha, but many great arhans in the time of the Buddha, even, even at the present time, if there are some like, very accomplished meditators, having one body to become many, to be in several places at the same time. Then having these many bodies to bring them together so that one has just one body. To vanish from one place, reappear suddenly someplace else, then to vanish from that place, reappear in other places. Then to move through a wall, through some kind of enclosure, like a fence, a barricade, through a mount, even through a mountain, a thick mountain, just as though it were thin air. without any impediment. And then to dive in and out of the earth as though it were water. 
than to walk across water without sinking as if it were earth. Then seated cross-legged to travel in space like a bird. I did that just about a little more than a week ago when I was coming back from California when I was sitting in that jet blue plane. I felt a little uncomfortable having my legs under the seat, so I sat them up in my seat and I crossed the legs and I was sitting (laughs) cross-legged like a bird. (laughs) With his hand, he touches and strokes the moon and sun, so powerful and mighty. And he wields bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma world. That is, he can travel with the body even up to the Brahma world. Okay, it might seem that these are to us miraculous powers. In the Christian world, I think that this is evidence that somebody is inspired by God. Evidence for the existence of a supreme deity. But for Buddhism, one is able to exercise these powers through developing the mind to the level of the jhanas. Through developing the mind to the jhanas and mastering the fourth jhana, especially the fourth jhana, then one could use that very powerful, very pure mind of the jhanas to transform material phenomena. Because especially when one gets to the fourth jhana and then through the fourth jhana to the arupa jhanas, then one is passed beyond the limits of material phenomena. It's the arupa jhanas which are the states beyond material phenomena. So a mind which has gone into the arupa jhanas through all the form jhanas to the arupa jhanas can understand the subtle principles that govern the workings of material phenomena. Not the way modern technology can, but in a different way. And so one can then use that powerful mind to manipulate the workings of material phenomena so that one can transform the hard, solid characteristics of the earth element and replace that hard, solid characteristics with the characteristics of the air element so that one could walk through solid solid walls just like they were air. Or one could focus upon the liquid characteristic of the water element and project upon it the hard, solid characteristic of the earth element. Then one could walk across it as though it were earth. Okay, so these are the what's called the iddies, the different types of supernormal powers or psychic powers. Then, in paragraph 7, the Buddha speaks about his divine ear element. That's the ability, the very purified ear, which is able to hear both kinds of sounds, heavenly and human sounds. So with this kind of ear, one could hear human sounds even at great distances, hundreds of miles away. One could hear conversations hundreds of miles away. And one could hear the sounds of heavenly beings. One could tune in on, one could have conversations with the devas in the heavens. One could hear the sounds of the insects. Those are sounds that are very near, but they're very subtle sounds that one normally can't hear. And then the Buddha says, he will never infer of me that 
I am able to use my mind to read the minds of other beings and to understand their different states of mind. Then here the Buddha mentions the different types of minds of others that he can understand. Again, we've gone. I've already gone through this in the earlier suttas. So these are the iddhis, the divine air element, the divine air element, and the ability to read the minds of others. These are powers of knowledge that are not unique to the Buddha, but these are qualities that the Buddha shares with many other arhats who have the six abhinyas, the six super knowledges, as well as with yogis and rishis who are not even followers of the Buddha's teaching, but who would just develop superior attainments in the practice of samadhi, meditative concentration. But now, beginning with paragraph 9, the Buddha is going to come to a certain collection of powers of knowledge that are for the most part unique to himself. These are called the ten Tathagata's powers. They're called in Pali Tathagata Bala. These are the dasa means ten tathagata bala, the ten tathagata's powers, the ten powers of the tathagata. And these are ten powers which are quite, in their totality, which are quite unique to the Buddha. And the Buddha emphasizes this uniqueness by saying that it's because he possesses these ten powers, these ten powers of knowledge that he claims, he uses poetic language here, he claims the place of the leader of the herd. The expression used here in the Pali, I didn't bring the text, I think it's Usabhatana or Nisabhatana, it means the place taken by the chief bull in a herd of, of cattle. You know, if you see a herd of cattle, there's one bull, which I think they might call it the A bull. Is that the expression? Alpha, alpha bull. It sort of, yeah, we have the expression bully. It sort of bullies its way to the top of the herd and it, doesn't allow anybody else to challenge its place. It's right there at the top of the herd. When the cow herd opens the, the cow pen, it's always the first one to get out. And when the food is put to the for the for the cow herd for, for the for the herd, it's the first one to make its way to the food. And it always has that sense of dignity and grandeur. Of course, the Buddha isn't a bully <laughs> like that. But the Buddha na- has this natural dignity and sense of being the leader of the herd. And then he roars, his lions roar in the assembly. Like we all say that we have this English expression that the lion is the king of the beasts. And also in India, they speak about the lion as being the king of the beasts. So it's a kind of universal idea that the lion of all the animals, the lion is the king because he has this very royal, regal um, manner about him. And when the lion lets out its roar, then all the other animals in the jungle keep quiet. None of them dares let out its roar or make a sound when the lion is roaring. There are several suttas which speak about 
which used the simile of the lion's roar to compare that with the Buddha's proclamation of the Dhamma. Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 22, sutra number, I think it's 56 or 58. And then it's possessing these ten powers that the Buddha is able to set rolling the wheel of Brahma. What's called the wheel of Brahma is the same as the wheel of Dhamma, the Dhamma Chakra. So all of the Buddhas, whether the Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, or any of the Buddhas of the past or of the future, they all possess these ten powers that enable them to set the wheel of Dhamma in motion, to teach the Dhamma in all of its fullness and all of its depth. And without these ten powers of knowledge, one can't be a fully enlightened Buddha. Okay, what are these ten powers of knowledge? Okay, the first of these is that the Tathagata understands as it actually is the possible as possible and the impossible as impossible. I translate this in accordance with the explanation given in there's a book of the Abhidhamma Bhitaka called the Vibhanga. It's the second book of the Abhidhamma Bhitaka. And it has a chapter on different types of knowledge. And in that chapter, it has a very long explanation of the ten Tathagata powers of knowledge. And so I translate this in accordance with the explanation given there. And then to understand this type of knowledge, we turn to Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 115. Okay, this is on page 928 of the Middle Length Discourses. You could open to that page because I want to go through these. Okay, here the Buddha is going to enumerate, discuss some things that are considered impossible and certain things that are possible. Okay, something that's impossible and that is that a person who possesses right view, who has experiential right view, cannot regard any formation, any conditioned thing as being permanent, cannot regard any conditioned thing as being sukha, that is pleasurable, a true source of lasting happiness and cannot regard any dhamma, any phenomenon as self. I'm on paragraph 12 on page 928. There's no such possibility. But it is possible that an ordinary person might regard some formations, conditioned things as being permanent, as being a source of lasting happiness and might regard some phenomena as being self. Then paragraph 13 deals what deals with what are called the heinous or terrible crimes. Okay, it's impossible for a person who possesses right view 
This is definite right view. This is the right view of somebody who has reached the level of stream entry, sotapati. A person who has definite right view cannot deprive his mother of life, cannot deprive his father of life, cannot take the life of an arhant, a fully liberated, fully purified being, cannot, with a mind of hatred, cause a Buddha to shed blood. Why doesn't it say that he can't take the life of a Buddha? Anybody know the answer? Want to venture a guess? I, I, I suppose it might have something to do with the Buddha being in Nirvana and not having a life that could be taken, although he was in bodily form, I suppose. He has a bodily form, yeah. Even an arhant, you could say, is in Nibbana in the sense of Nibbana while alive. Somebody want to try? Try. Because the bullet is indestructible? It's a good guess. I think he has good com- uh, complete confidence in the Buddha. Who has complete confidence in the Buddha? Uh, here is this um, a person possessing right view he will have confidence in the Buddha and he won't no but the question is why can't anybody else I'm not talking about of course a person who has complete confidence in the Buddha wouldn't try to take a Buddha's life but why can't anybody else my question is why is it not mentioned that it is impossible. Oh, I'm getting a little mixed up. Why isn't it mentioned? Okay, it's mentioned that a person possessing right view will not deprive his father of life, will not deprive his mother of life, will not deprive his father of life, will not deprive an arhant of life. But it is not said it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could with a mind of hate shed a Tathagata's blood. Okay, that's impossible. But it's not said it is impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could deprive the Tathagata of life. So why is that not said to be impossible? No, it's not just a variant. Somebody was on the right track when they said, of course the Tathagata dies, the Buddha dies, but it's part of like the fixed nature of things that he can't be killed by another person, by another living being, but he always dies a natural death. That's said to be like part of the fixed nature of things. He'll die from an illness, from old age, but not at the hand of a person who kills him. Okay, and then it's impossible, it cannot happen that a person possessing right view could cause a schism in the Sangha. That is, somebody with right view could maliciously when the Sangha is united, could divide the Sangha, could try to cause it to split into two factions. These five acts are called the five, sometimes it's translated the five terrible crimes, the five acts with immediate retribution because they're said to lead to immediate rebirth in the lower realm. That's taking the life of one's mother, taking the life of one's father, 
taking the life of an arhant with a mind of hatred, shedding the blood of the Buddha and maliciously causing schism in a unified Sangha. And then the sixth thing that's said to be impossible is for a person with right view to acknowledge or point to another teacher. What this means is to regard another, somebody else besides the Buddha as being, the, po- the Pali word here is satta, which means like a supreme spiritual teacher. It doesn't mean that somebody who regards the Buddha as the supreme teacher can't learn some other subject from another teacher. But he doesn't regard him as being the satta, the, you know, the master of a spiritual, of the spiritual, spiritual system. But all of these things, it said, are possible for an ordinary person, a person without any degree of realization, an ordinary person. So as long as we don't have the definite right view of stream entry, it's still possible for us to take the life of our mother, take the life of our father, to kill an arhant, to injure the Buddha, maliciously injure the Buddha, to create schism in the Sangha, and to turn to another teacher, to look to another teacher and say, that's my refuge, not the Buddha. I give up the Buddha, but I turn to another teacher as my refuge. Okay, some other things that are impossible Okay, it cannot happen that in one world system there can be two fully enlightened Buddhas teaching at the same time. But that they can have their same, their teachings, their dhammas existing at the same time. In any world system, Buddhas have to arise in succession. It's something like well, I wish that this were, <laughs> weren't true, but <laughs> in, say, in America, you can't have two presidents presiding at the same time. <laughs> because um, in any world system, it could only contain the power of one, this is what it said, of one completely fully enlightened Buddha. It would be too much for a world system to contain the two Buddhas at the same time. And it's also said that two wheel-turning monarchs, this is called the Chakavati Raja, this is the great virtuous empire, can arise, cannot arise simultaneously in one world system but they can arise successively in the same world system okay paragraph 15 this one I have to explain it might be somewhat controversial okay it says it is impossible it cannot happen that a woman could be an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one. There is no such possibility. Now, this doesn't mean that somebody who is a woman now cannot become a perfectly enlightened Buddha in the future. But what it means is that the one who is a fully enlightened Buddha manifests in male form. And this is probably because one has to understand that the teaching is conceived against the background of the Indian social system in, <laughs> in which in the position, of author- the position of authority 
is taken by the male. Now, the Buddha says that men or women are both capable of achieving enlightenment, of achieving liberation. That is open to everyone equally. And in that, gender is of no consequence. There's a little sutta that comes in, I think in Sangyutta Nikaya, is spoken by the bhikkhuni, I think it's Soma is her name. She's meditating in solitude and Mara comes to her and says, why are you meditating? What can you achieve? You're a woman with just a woman's two-fingered wisdom. You can't gain anything. And then she says, what does it matter whether one is a man or a woman when the mind is concentrated and insight is flowing sharply then whether one is a man or a woman that does not matter at all you are deluded Mara go away okay but within the way of thinking in the Indian social system Authority is exercised by the male. And to establish the religious order in the world within this framework of thinking becomes the function of somebody who can exercise that authority. And so within this way of thinking that would become a task that falls to a male. This is the way I would understand it. And so by the same token, it's also said that it cannot happen that a woman can become a wheel-turning monarch or can occupy the position of Saka. But I don't want to say that the Buddha is wrong, but... <laughs> The Buddha might have said, it cannot happen that a woman can become the president of a country, the leader of an empire, but there was Queen Elizabeth I of England, who was one of the greatest monarchs of history, Queen Victoria of England, one of the greatest monarchs of history, if he would have seen into the 20th century of India itself, Indira Gandhi, the most powerful, one of the most powerful rulers of the late 20th century, (laughs) he might have had some surprises in store for him. (laughs) And also, a woman cannot occupy the position of Mara, so even some of the bad positions are reserved for men. Okay. In paragraph 16, we now come to what's possible and impossible with regard to the working of karma. Okay, it is impossible, it cannot happen that bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct can produce a good result, something that's desired and wished for. That's impossible. But it is possible that bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct will produce a disagreeable result, pain, misery, misfortune. So this is the fixed law that bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct, when it ripens, this bad karma, when it ripens, it has to produce misery as its result. Then paragraph 17 gives the other side of this. It is impossible, it cannot happen that good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, good mental conduct will produce misery as its result. 
but when good bodily, verbal, and mental conduct produce its results, produce their results, what they will produce is something good and desired, that it will produce fortune and happiness as its result. Okay. Then paragraph 18 deals with the realms of rebirth produced through different types of karma. Okay, it is impossible, it cannot happen. We have to read this carefully. It cannot happen that a person engaging in bodily, verbal, and mental misconduct could, on that account, for that reason, with the breakup of the body after death, reappear, be reborn in a happy destination, even in the happily in the heavenly world, that is impossible. Now a person that engages in misconduct might be reborn in a happy destination, but not on account of that bad karma. A person performs many different types of deeds, bad deeds and good deeds. If the person performs bad deeds and good deeds, it could happen that the good deed, the good karma, causes the rebirth. Then the person will be reborn in a happy destination. But if it's the bad deed that takes on the role of generating the rebirth, then when that bad deed brings about the rebirth, it will be rebirth into a bad destination. So therefore, the Buddha goes on to say, it is possible that a person engaging in bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, mental misconduct, might on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, reappear in a state of deprivation, an unhappy destination, in the lower world, even in hell. There is such a possibility. So when the bad karma takes on the role of producing rebirth, it produces rebirth in the lower realm. Okay, then one understands, paragraph 19, it cannot happen that a person engaging in good bodily, verbal, or mental conduct could on that account, for that reason, on the dissolution of the body after death, be reborn in a lower world, in an unhappy destination, in hell. That's impossible. Now, a person who engages in good conduct might be reborn in the lower worlds. But if he's reborn there, it's because some bad karma that that person has done has come up into the mind about the, around the time of death and taken on the role of generating rebirth. But if the good karma takes on the role of generating the rebirth, then it will bring about rebirth in a happy destination, even in the heavenly world. So this is all part of the fixed law, the working of the law of karma. So all of this is part of the knowledge of what is impossible and what is possible. So all of this is explained in Sutta number 115 as what a disciple can understand. But a disciple understands this in dependence on the guidance given by the Buddha. But it's the Buddha who discovers this, who is the first one to open all of this up and to see the workings of all of these rules, these laws, these 
principles that guide the unfolding of events. That's why the Buddha is known as the Samasambuddha, the fully, perfectly enlightened one. Okay, maybe I'll stop here and then ask if there are any questions. Let me just ask one thing on the, you refer to the Patika Sutta yeah. 24. How is that spelled? Okay, so. okay. it's, I'll, I'll write it on the board. But if you just look in the long discourses of the Buddha, just look at Sutta number 24, you'll find it. Pate, uh, in paragraph 17 of what we were just reading, um, it sounds like, I'm sure the Buddha is not denying that actions can have unintended consequences. But when he says, you understand it's impossible, it cannot happen that an unwished for undesired disagreeable result could be produced from good bodily conduct, good verbal conduct, etc., there is no such possibility. Okay, state the question then. Well, it, it sounds as if he's denying that actions can have unintended consequences. Okay. I just want to state this for the, um, for the recording, because it's a good, important question. And I thought, well, maybe the way to, to, to resolve that is to, where we, where we see the word result, he's talking about action. So that if someone does an action with a good will, what they're doing is good, even if it has accidentally bad consequences. Uh, okay. Before you answer, let me just repeat the question, then I'll, I will answer it. Can you phrase the question very concisely? Is the, is the Buddha denying that good actions can have unintended bad consequences? Okay, he said, the question is, by the statement that comes in paragraph 17, which says that it is impossible, it cannot happen that in unwished for, undesired, disagreeable result could be produced from good bodily, verbal, mental conduct. Is the Buddha denying that a good deed could have unintended, undesirable consequences? Okay, that's an important question because here one has to understand the technical implications of the Pali word, which are not quite conveyed by the English translation of the word result. The Pali word here is vipaka. I'll write that on the board. Vipaka, and it's sometimes also replaced metaphorically by another word, pala, which means fruit. Now what's meant by vipaka is not simply what we call the results or consequences of an action, but vipaka means the maturation of an action within the life process of the agent. It's the maturation of a karma within the life process of an agent, the maturation of the karma in a way that reacts upon the agent and brings about the consequences of that karma for that agent. And so the law that holds sway over karma is that actions mature or bring about their vipaka in a way that corresponds to the ethical nature of the original action. And the ethical character of the original action is determined by the intention that motivated the original action. So that when an action is performed with good motivation, say it's motivated by generosity, by kindness, by a wish to be helpful, it's guided by some wisdom, then it's a good action, considered a good karma. Then when that action brings about results, 
it brings about as vipaka, then that vipaka will be something which is desired, wished for, and agreeable for the agent. Of course, an action that's motivated by generosity, say, by kindness, can have undesired consequences, undesired results, but that would not be the vipaka. For example, I might see a poor person in the street, I want to help that person, so I make some arrange to give that person some, say, a poor child. I arrange for that child to get an education. The child grows, gets a good education and grows up to be an unscrupulous, ruthless businessman who drives all of his competitors out of business. And then becomes just, you know, completely hard, hard, cruel, um, <laughs> ferocious um, businessman, or even worse. <laughs> so those you could say are unintended consequences of my good action, but the fact that I was helping a poor child get an edu- education is still a good action because it's motivated by compassion and generosity. Any further questions? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, In the beginning of the lecture, uh, you were talking about um, the Arupajanas and uh, the Buddha's special powers to manipulate material phenomena, and I was I was wondering, um, I have to the question. Um, in Western philosophy, we sometimes distinguish between different kinds of substance, material, mental, or spiritual mm-hmm. substance. Um, is 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 the Buddhist worldview being um, expounded here? Uh, I guess it's committed to an immaterial realm that is interwoven with material in some sense. Is that the correct way of thinking about it? That there's interaction between the two sort of problems that trouble Descartes about mind-body interaction would also potentially be a question for the Buddha as well. Except the Buddha doesn't, Buddhism doesn't conceive of mental phenomena and material phenomena as being substances, things that interact. But there's a distinction of mental phenomena and material phenomena. And then different relations are posited between mental phenomena and material phenomena. But they never conceive of it to be a problem. It's just considered that mental phenomena can act upon physical phenomena and physical physical phenomena can act upon mental phenomena. For example, it's said that the eye is a physical phenomena, material phenomena, and yet it's a a faculty condition for a mental phenomena, which is visual consciousness, chaku vijnana. And so visual consciousness, eye consciousness, arises based upon the eye, the eye base, the eye faculty. Um, and then conversely, volition is a mental phenomena. And yet that phenomena is capable of acting upon the body, causing bodily phenomena like Movement. And then in in the Buddhist text, a complex pro- explanation is given of how that occurs in terms of the Indian physiology of the Buddha's time. In the, this is in the Pali commentaries. Right. I, I was going to comment that, that in, in sort of conventional Indian metaphysics, mind is actually on the same side, ontological side of matter, and then it's Atman, which is different from 
And so, in, in the Buddhist metaphysic sphere, would that be the same? In other words, Nala and Rupa are sort of um, uh, different phenomena, but, but happily grouped together, whereas the Arupa is transcendent or supernormal or... Well, we should say that the, the Nama parts, the mental parts, in one sense, they're arupa, they're non-material, though they're different from the arupa realm, which are the realms of the arupa, of the, the arupa jhanas. But the arupa jhanas are very, very exalted states of consciousness, of mind, um, in which material form is left behind. But those states can still be attained within the human realm with, with our material bodies. But in those states, the mind doesn't have a, any kind of form as an object, which is why they're originally, or that's originally why they're called our rupa jhanas. But the explanation that I gave of how the meditator who masses the rupa jhanas can then act upon form in order to transform its characteristics, that's my own explanation. It's not just an explanation given in the Buddhist texts. Um, it just seems to me to be the logical explanation of how somebody who masses the fourth jhana, which is the highest jhana of the form realm, or goes beyond into the formless jhanas, should then be able to understand the sort of subtle principles that govern the workings of material form. And even now, there are supposed to be like yogis in India, whether it's true or not, whether some say that they're just charlatans who are capable of performing very subtle tricks, magical tricks that people are not able to catch. Others say that they're true wonder workers. You know, they go up to them and then they just open their hands and then they hand you a watch or a photograph. You have that they have just a blank hand then they close the hand and they open it again and they give you a photograph of themselves. <laughs> then if you're impressed by these types of things, then you become their devotees. <laughs> okay, we'll stop for the evening. And next week it will be Tuesday. And don't have to worry because I'll be here continuously. I won't be depending on any ride. <laughs> Okay, we end by sharing the merit. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika bunyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika Punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu de sanang akasata chabumata deva naga mehitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang Etavata cha am he he sampadang punya sampadang Sabe deva anumodantu Saba sampati sidia Etavata cha am he he sampadang punya sampadang Sabe buta anumodantu Saba sampati sidia